I don't really have any like opening statement um, other than this is I thought we had an absolutely great year. It was a tremendous story that was developing and uh, <clears throat> with a lot of stories, the endings aren't very good, you know, but I thought we had a year that, that we could really be proud of and doing what we did throughout the course of the season, overcoming a lot of adversity and getting to the last 16 seconds of the seventh game of the Eastern Conference Finals is, uh, is uh, quite a feat. So I was proud of the team, you know, proud of the coaches. I thought they did an incredible job and, uh, and sorry that it ended the way that it did. Uh, you, you guys have had a, obviously a lot of great teams uh, during your time here. So you've been faced with this, the, the, this decision many times. Um, just when you're trying to decide of whether to run it back or if a team needs changes to kind of invigorate the roster, what type of factors go into that type of decision? I run it back with my wife every week. So, you know, <laughs> and we always come to good, 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 good terms. And, and, even if we ran it back, uh, we would have a very good team. But you have to be, I think, very proactive in looking at how you're going, you know, to improve. And you know, this is a great, a great story that started in 2019. So in 27 years, if we've had, you know, a start to a number of great stories, this is one of them when we signed Jimmy Butler, and then started to build the team from there. You know, drafting Justice Winslow and Josh Richardson, and then getting Bam, and then Ian Tyler and KZ and Precious, you know, and Duncan and some of the other young guys that we talk about all the time is that, is that you're caught in betwixt and in between right now with, with these young players that are, that are rising, you know. I mean, think about, you know, Tatum and, uh, and Brown, where they were three or four years ago in their playoff runs, you know. And so, you know, once your, your younger players can elevate to a point that, that you know that you can win with them, and along with Jimmy and the other veteran guys, then, then you can always think about running it back and be successful. But is that going to be... Uh, what's going to lead to a championship, and that's, that's all you think about. So I haven't, I don't know what anybody has written or read. I mean, it's going to be read. I haven't read anything or listened to anything, but I don't know what you've written, and I don't know what you've said. So I don't know what's been said from last Sunday <laughs> because I took a break, an absolute break, and uh, from... What I, what I felt would probably be an assault. <laughs> you know, it's just the way it is. But I did get my granddaughter, Olivia, to clap at nine months. Let's go heat, let's go heat, let's go heat. I got her to do this on FaceTime, let's go heat. That was quite an accomplishment of coaching. Pat, I guess in simpler terms, do you think this current core can win a championship as is, or does it need a, another star, second-level score, whatever it may be, uh, to get over that hump? I think we all uh, realize that you can always use more, especially when you've gone through a season and then you've gotten the result. Then you begin to really analyze the result and, and why it wasn't as good as maybe you thought it. You know, you thought it you know should be, and so we're always going to try to improve the team. You know, and uh, and I think that's what it's about. It's about continually growing and uh, taking your hits, dealing with them, going home, and uh, you know taking your wins and enjoying those and going home. But it's 106 games that we played, and uh, and we did a lot of great things. So I don't want to take away from anything that this this team has done in these individuals. You know, as to your question, do we need another? You know, if there's one out there, throw them to me. <laughs> you know, I mean, but you can always use more, but, but it's got to be a good fit, but not at the cost of, 
of, of doing something that that could be sort of prohibitive. So we will look, we will explore. We always do this. You know, it's part of uh, the business that we chose. And, and whatever the result brings after that season, then you might say we might need another this or another that based on how the league is playing, other teams are playing and matching up with certain teams and stuff like that. So that goes into the equation, yeah. I'm gonna talk about it. Pat, keeping in mind that you're in a win-now mode, as you almost always are, and the fact that you've been able to get talent after the draft, does that make you more inclined to use these suddenly available draft picks this year and next as trade chips rather than investing in another late first-round player? Well, where we're drafting is, you know, is, is late at 27. So, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of good players that have been drafted, you know, down there. And... Um, but it, it's sort of a crapshoot, you know, when, when you're looking for talent and it isn't ready-made at the top of the lottery. And sometimes at the top of the lottery, it's not, you know, you can make a mistake there too. Uh, you know, as far as our draft choices, they're, they're valuable to us. We finally got them back in order a little bit. And, uh, and so we're going to use them. But I, in, unless something presents itself, you know, that, that causes you to say, hey, I think I'll do this, uh, that would uh, transcend drafting somebody, then I would always consider that. But, but that's all part of the discussion between now and the draft. Considering some of the injuries that took place late in the season, uh, do you feel like there's a concern about building an older roster? And do you see it as a necessary thing to upgrade and become younger at the same time? But we're young. We got a lot of good young pieces, and those young pieces got hurt too. You know, I, I don't want to really talk about, you know, injuries, but you know, the kind of soft tissue injuries that are happening on a regular basis in the NBA—it's almost like it's chronic, and uh, the catastrophic injuries aren't as much. But guys are missing time for, you know. So these soft tissue injuries, and I can call them soft tissue injuries because you know, whether it's a hamstring or a groin or a calf or something, uh, you know, guys are sitting out missing time. So it was untimely for us to have some of those uh, at a time when, when you wanted everybody healthy. So as far as the age of the roster, I think, I think our roster is you know, pretty, pretty almost, almost perfect from a, from a real veteran age standpoint where players can play and contribute and we got the middle group of guys that are starting to rise up and then we got some real young guys and uh, even though we don't have that many real young guys i just saw some young guys i saw six of them upstairs <laughs> really young but um, you have to be a little bit concerned about the injuries and and so <clears throat> you know when you have injuries that derail your opportunity uh, we had that in the bubble. It was a direct hit to Bam. That wasn't an injury of attrition. It was a direct hit to his arm and the shoulder, and and then Gorin, you know, got hurt, and uh, so that hurt us. And and these injuries, uh, these soft tissue injuries in the playoffs, definitely hurt us too. But we still had a chance, you know. I mean, you just sort of rise above, and I think that's one of the great stories, you know, this year is that. We did find out a lot about other players when they were put in a position of having to play 25 to 30, 35 minutes. And it opens up your eyes to what the possibilities could be for them a year or two from now. And so there's this blend of when does it become perfect? <laughs> and you never know it's ever going to become perfect until you win a championship. And then you'll say, you know, that, that worked out at that time perfectly. and. Uh, and we dodge a lot of bullets along the way, and, and you can win a championship. So I've been through this a number of times, and I like the team that we have, and uh, I like the core. And so let's see where we can go internally, and, and let's see where we can go if something presents itself, if, if that's a viable option. But I'm not really concerned about the age. 
I'm not because there's, there's more geezers in this league, <laughs> you know, playing <laughs> at the top of their game. And so you can't really depend on them. You know, that, that's why you got your, your, your other guys. I mean, you can depend on them, but not the way they were, you know, back at 25 years old, but they can still, you know, they can still do a lot for you. Pat, obviously, uh, Tyler had a fantastic uh, season, winning sixth man of the year. Curious what you thought of his postseason before the injury. And he said last week that he does want to start next season. What does he have to do to kind of solidify that for the next part of his career? Well, I think his numbers speak for, you know, him and in his game. You know, averaging 20 a game and, you know, really shooting the ball well, uh, developing a game that, that at times during the regular seasons, unstoppable for him for him to try to find a shot. He can find and create his own shots in a lot of different situations. So he's, I don't even think he's here yet. You know, really here yet as a as a full time complete uh, player. And I say that about a player that averaged 20 and shot 37, 38 percent from three, can score in bunches can score at the rim, can score on floaters, can score on pull-ups, can score on threes. You know, I mean, he gets out on the break. Um, and he's 22. He's 21, 22 years old. So, uh, you know, the next step for him, and I think we're seeing this in, in the league, if you want to win a championship and, and you want to be a starter, uh, you really have to become a two-way player today. And you have to improve in certain areas of your game. Now, we all know that at one time or another, you know, that, you know, teams will always put a target on Tyler's back or Duncan's back or Max's back or somebody else that they think they can beat one-on-one -on, -one on a switch. And so I saw improvement in his defense this year. He's got great feet. He's got quick feet. And he just needs to get stronger again, you know, and – you know, another 10 pounds of, of muscle mass, and, and, and he just needs to get stronger from a leverage standpoint because I think he's he still has a lot to the upside. But as far as being a starter, come to training camp and win it. Yeah, come to training camp and win it. Sometimes it's that easy, and sometimes, you know, the fit, as Spo, you know, talked about over the last two or three years, he, it was better for us coming in, balancing the energy of scoring uh, and having somebody that could can really you know, control the ball. So if he wants to be a starter, we'll see in October. That's something that you earn, you know? And uh, there's no doubt that he has the qualities to be that. Pat wanted to ask you about Vic and Duncan. With Vic, did he show you enough in the couple months to make you think we would like to continue on with him, or do you need to give that more thought? And with Duncan, how do you get him back to what he was a couple years ago? You, the whole organization, coaching staff, and Duncan. Well, Duncan, you know, it's the first playoff game. This year he got 27 points. <laughs> he had eight threes. And he's, he's a specialist, and you can't win – in this league without having them. You gotta have some some specialists, guys who can rebound, block shots, some guys that can, you know, can make threes, you know, at the rate that he can make them. And but I saw improvement in his game now where he's going downhill. He's gotta turn the corner on handoffs and on pick and rolls and things of that nature because he's being forced off the line. And so now the next part of his development is you know, going to the basket and finishing and making plays and, and being very aggressive that way. And, and we saw that this year. And it isn't just off of random offside, you know, ball cuts or basket cuts where he scores too. So, uh, again, defensively, uh, as, as a young player, even though he's not as young as some of the other guys, he's got to get better. And, look, we hang our hat on that. You know, I, I'm not going to say that, you know, we lost a game because we had some horrendous three-point shooting games or somebody missed a three or whatever it is. If you don't guard all three areas of the court, if you don't guard the three-point line, if you don't guard two-point shots, if you don't guard at the elbow, if you don't guard at the rim, if you don't guard in transition, if you don't defend by rebounding, okay, by taking charges, by getting loose balls and winning that war every night, then you're always going to blame it on shooting or something. And so, 
to me, yes, Duncan can improve. Uh, that message has been delivered to him many times. But that's where we as a team have to win. And we have to win defensively, as well as what we can do from an offensive standpoint. So we have shown that this year that at times when we didn't shoot the ball well, that our defense carried us. And, and we have a good defensive team. And I'm not going to uh, say that you know, because we had some bad three-point shooting games that that was the reason you know, that we didn't you know, get to the finals. Um, Vic's story is off the charts, you know, so I know you can write about it and uh, I'm sorry that you asked me a two-part question because I got so carried away on Duncan, sorry. you know, <laughs> but uh, it was a great story and watching him work, you know, watching him come back and then watching him get into games and, and and it wasn't easy at the beginning uh, when he had 21 in Toronto and then 40 in Orlando. And you started to see some things that he could do again uh, that you saw in the past. And, and, and then in the playoffs, I thought he had some great moments for us. And he was the kind of player that I felt as, you know, the series began to grow. I mean, all of them began to grow and became more competitive defensively that that you do need players that can break down, you know, a defense on their own or with their quickness and slashing, you know, can create their own shots. And uh, so we'll see where that goes because Vic's uh, obviously he's a free agent and, and we have his bird rights uh, and we'll definitely be talking to uh, his agent. Pat, PJ can also become a free agent if he obviously opts out. If if he does opt out and become free, uh, free agent, how much of a priority will it be to bring him back just based on his importance to the team this past season? Well, you know, PJ is like a, a cornerstone. You know, he was like, you know, when UD was in his prime, even though UD wasn't, you know, a primary scorer, uh, he did things throughout the course of a game that were significant. I can remember going back to 2006, we all remember, you know, that kind of player who wasn't Shaq or wasn't Zell or he wasn't Dwayne or, or, or whoever, you know, made the biggest plays in the fourth quarter for us offensively to win that championship. And so that's what Tuck does. You know, Tuck is the kind of player that doesn't have to do a lot, you know, from a scoring standpoint, but he makes so many great plays for you. And, he is like a cornerstone for us, you know, uh, toughness, rebounding, defense, no-nonsense guy. And so, you know, I'd love to have Tuck back next year. You know, I mean, he's, he's part of our core, and we'll see what happens. There's not enough like him in the league. No, there are. There's a lot of guys like him in the league, but he's special. Pat, you've always spoken to us. As a player gets older, his conditioning has to get even better to keep up with that. Um, Kyle Lowry this season, when you look at him as a 36-year-old player going on 37, where he stands conditioning-wise, what he looked like at the end of the season, how much of a priority is that for you to do what you've done with a bunch of your older players and maybe be a little bit more demanding as a player ages into that? You know, Kyle had uh, a challenging year for a lot of reasons, and uh, I don't have to get into them. They're personal. They're, they're other things. But he had a challenging year with the move and 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 everything uh, earlier in the season. With uh, he had some injuries, missed some time, and then there were some personal issues. But look at the the bottom line with me and for me uh, as far as. Uh, hoping that you can get the most out of a player. I don't have to go back and, and talk about it, is that you got to be in world-class shape. You just have to be. And, and uh, that is something as you get older, there's a point of diminishing returns as you get a little bit older, that when you're younger, you can, you know, you can do things in spite of that, but I'm not saying that when he was younger, he wasn't in the kind of condition that he was in this year, but he definitely is going to have to address that and uh, it will be addressed. And to get to what the perfect, you know, 
overall conditioning for him to be successful because he plays the game you know in a manner where he needs his strength and his size you know he's uh, he's not you know he's not Tyler Hero he's he's not that lean kind of guy but but I think he can be in better shape and you know and I do believe that the pain of of losing and the reminders that you send out about this, uh, you know, might change his mind a little bit. But I do think that uh, that he can be in better shape next year, and you know, we'll address it and we'll try to help him as best as we can because it's not easy when you get a little bit older. So, uh, but contrary to what he says, I don't think it was a wasted year. You know, he said it was a wasted year. I mean. Uh, I've had that feeling myself as a coach, you know, when you've done as much as you can do and then you just sort of like, you know, I mean, it was championship or bust for, for Kyle. He came here with that notion and he's very, very disappointed uh, in uh, the fact that we, we couldn't get to the finals and win it. So he'll do whatever he has to do, I think, Ira. Um, we've sort of gone through this with you a, a few times and you always defer eric's the coach he makes the decisions we've talked about going bigger a uh, different approach at center we had the hassan and bam combination eric worked that out bam Adebayo is in many ways not the typical prototypic center you work with over your over the years the true big man different hybrid i understand that is there any thought from you about being able to number one play him with omar yurtsevin and go big big more often and number two how different is it for you to watch that kind of center leading one of your teams versus what you had in Kareem and Patrick and, and, and Zoe and Shaq and those kind of centers? Sort of your thoughts on today's centers, please. So you just described my career, didn't you? Yeah, Zoe, Patrick, Kareem, yeah. okay, Shaq, okay, you know, they don't make them like that anymore, Ira. They really don't. They don't train them like that anymore. There are some. Obviously, Joel, you know, and uh, Jokic, uh, you know, these guys are, are prototype, you know, back to the basket centers, but also they can shoot threes, you know, from that standpoint. They're very versatile, their ball handling skills, all of those things. And uh, we wouldn't think twice about, you know, uh, trying to use players uh, like Zoe, you know, in that context, you know, during that, you know. You know, put his butt down underneath that basket. If he took a turnaround jumper, I would give him one of those a game as a throwaway. But, uh, you know, Zoe was always 80% at the rim, and, and most of those other centers were the same way. Speaking particularly to Bam, uh, you know, he's been asked to do a lot of things, you know, as a young player, and he has grown into being very efficient at doing these things. So. You know, it's almost that learning curve of being a facilitating big, either at the elbow on handoffs, on pick and rolls, or, or whatever he's doing. He's always getting somebody open. Duncan should pay him half his check. Tyler should pay him half his check. Max should pay him half his check. I mean, you don't realize what he does to get people open. And, and a lot of that has to do with how other teams are playing him because they're dropping way back and we can get that shot. But maybe we look for that a little bit too much. Um, this could be uh, a year, and Spo and I'll sit down and talk about it, about how can, how can BAM be developed uh, in a way uh, to improve his consistent shot ability every night, getting 15 shots every night and um, quality shots, you know, that he can get, that he can create, you know, whether it's in the post, whether it's the elbow or, or whatever. Uh, he can be very prolific at times, but it can't always just be on, on effort, on running, on offensive rebounds, on lob dunks, you know, on little floaters. Uh, I do think there's, there's a part of him that can, can grow. And so that, that's dependent a little bit on your overall offensive philosophy and how much you want to change that. But I think you're right. I think there's another level at his age now that we need more consistency in his ability to get good shots, create good shots for himself and us and, uh, and score. I, this We always ask you usually the last question, but I don't know how long we're going. 20, 27 years? I've got the whole day. All right. Tim. No, I really don't, but I have the whole day. Um, 27 years in, um, lots accomplished. You know, there's always a thought that Pat would always go out with a bang. And you made it to the Eastern Conference Finals and within one game of going to the NBA Finals. Where do you sort of stand as far as, one, 
I don't, this might sound too cold, I apologize. Do you see a finish line of this job? And number two, is this something where that's so far in the distant that you're already planning one, three, five years out because of who you are? Well, I, I definitely feel an obligation to finish this build. And so if, if we're three years into this build, then and I don't want to do another three years of just building this team. I mean, I think we're in that window of, of internal improvement. We got a great, great, great player in Jimmy Butler. We know that. Uh, we have a lot of real experienced veterans. And so we put together a team that got to the Eastern Conference Finals, and, and it was bitter. It was a bitter loss. I mean, I mean, the dragon hasn't, you know, actually left my body yet from, from, from that loss. You know, it, it was... You know, <laughs> I was stunned. Uh, you know, I was frustrated. I was angry. I was all of those things, uh, you know, for the last week. And now I'm, I'm beginning to move on past all of that. And so I, I haven't given that any thought at all, Ira, you know. And so until somebody brings it to me, other than the media, I'm 77 years old. And right now I can do more push-ups than you can do right now. If you want to go to, if you want to, go to the mat, let's go. Shirt's off. Shirt's off, Riley. <laughs> can you see that? No, no um, one needs to see that. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I haven't thought much about that. I just, you know, I mean, th this was a great year for us. I was happy with this year. I watched the young players playing. I sit in that box with Zoe and, you know, Andy's in front of me with, with Adam and, and, you know, we don't talk a lot. We just sort of stare at the game and watch it, write down notes and everything. And there are nights that I am so excited about watching this game and the evolution of the game and the players. It's so different than it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago when I, when I coached in L.A. It just, it's, it's a different game, a different time, and, and we have to stay one step ahead of the posse uh, in order to stay one step away from, you know what it's called, the street, you know, so, and that's what we're going to continue to try to do. Udonis had mentioned he was non-committal about returning back to the court as a player, but he said no matter what, he still wants a role with this organization. Just your thoughts on him coming back, how important he is to the team in the locker room, and what kind of role do you foresee him having with this organization moving forward in his future? When you got 20 years of experience, like he does, um, and he's knowledgeable, and he has the right disposition, you know, for this organization, you know, we want him to be in this organization as long as he wants to be. I mean, you know, defining exactly what it is that he wants to do. I mean, I would love to have UD around you know in in whatever capacity and so we haven't discussed any of that because i uh, i still think he's struggling with you know i want to be on the court that's the biggest thing that i miss about about it about coaching in or when i was a sometime player back a long time ago is that when you when you're in the game and all your anxiety and all your stress, you know, and adrenaline is in that game. And when I sit there and look at it, I don't have any way to release <laughs> what I know was a great feeling when I coached. You know, that, that, that adrenaline and that, that anxiety and that stress is all right out there in competition. And so he'll have a hard time, <laughs> you know, with that because you miss that as much as the camaraderie and all of the other things. And so... Uh, I'll sit down with UD. I love him to death. You know, I don't even know if people remember how it all started with UD and me. And we were in Puerto Rico and playing a preseason game back in his rookie year, 2003. And I had not, you know, decided on a starting lineup yet. We had Mar Odom, we had Brian Grant, we had Eddie Jones, we had Cron, uh, we had uh, uh, Dwayne, we just drafted, and we got this kid. Uh, not this kid, excuse me, we've got this man, you know, UD is, a, is sort of a rookie we just signed and went through training camp and, you know, everybody assumed that it was going to be Lamar Odom as the starting power forward. And when we got down to Puerto Rico uh, for our walkthrough, I named him as the power forward. And not one person, you know, like rolled their eyes and said, well, Lamar should be in there or, 
or, or whatever. And ever since that day, that's what UD is. He's a starter. He is he is a guy who grinds. He's got more talent than than he ever has been given credit for because he simply decided and and played the role that that team needed, you know, to win and. That was one of my favorite teams of all time. I was talking about Quran the other day, and I apologized to him. You know, well, 20 years later, I said, "I'm sorry, I traded you." <laughs> you know? And I said, "But I always would wonder how Eddie and Dwayne and you and Lamar and Udonis and Brian Grant. I always wonder how that team would have been if it stayed together for two or three years, and uh, and uh, it didn't." And, but we ended up winning the championship. I don't know if that was the cost of maybe having something that could have been a longer run, but UD was a, part of it, a big part of that team. And he had big, a big part of this organization you know, for a long time, and so we'll see where that goes. Yeah. I ask you this knowing that you had a very good season, knowing you were one of the final three teams standing, and knowing that Boston had, had an excellent defense. That said, were there ever any times in that series or during the playoffs, Pat, where you said to yourself, we need to get Jimmy another big time scorer to play with him to make things easier for our half court offense and for Jimmy? Yeah. Well, I, th I think that's a valid question, you know, uh, and I think it's almost maybe a consensus around. Uh, you know, the league, you know, by people who know what they're talking about, who study the league and, 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 and know what it takes to really be successful, you know, from that standpoint. So, um, you know, as I said earlier uh, about that, you know, Jimmy, uh, you know, has a very unique game, uh, not having Tyler, you know, just having Tyler at his best, you know, which could always, you know, they could work off of one another, and they can play together. But, uh, and, and that's for, you know, you know, going back to Iris' question about, uh, about BAM, maybe this is where internally now it's time to, to go in that direction with more responsibility. Now, if there's something from outside that avails itself that doesn't cost us an arm and a leg that, that could fit that, that building, I'd always be interested in looking at that, but but uh, I think we have what we need internally. But we'll, we'll see, you know, from that standpoint. If you have a perfect, you know, replacement or a perfect player, then why don't you text me? You don't even have my number, do you? My number. <laughs> no. Pat, as you step into summer league, and that's only a couple of weeks away, can you speak to the luxury of having a staff like Adam Simon and Eric Glass, and you talk about the luxury of having these younger, up-and-coming kids that really have embraced that two-way, Gabe and Max Struess, and those were all part of the, you know, the G League um, development team. Um, can, can you first speak to, since everyone's asking two-part questions, first speak to uh, the, uh, the great staff that you have in um, mm -hmm. you know, your, your, your uh, G League developmental team and um, what you're looking forward to in this upcoming couple of weeks in, in Las Vegas? Well, you know, we're, we're still rebounding from this you know, as a staff, too. Um, some of them look like the walking dead. I don't know which one I could call Rick, you know, but you know, it's only been a week for those that, that haven't watched The Walking Dead. I haven't either, but, but Rick is, is cool. <laughs> but my point is, is that they were here today, okay, and they're working out six young guys up there and uh, basically draft prospects, and they worked them out with the enthusiasm like nothing happened, and I know they're still feeling it. So we got a great staff of coaches and trainers more than enough that do their own job and then they do each other's job and they cover for one another. You know, when somebody takes a vacation, they make sure somebody else is here to take care of this player or that player. And, and Spo has really built, I think, over the last, you know, four or five years, a staff that he's re really comfortable with. And, uh, and, and there were some other additions, you know, downstairs that makes it uh, a little bit more seamless. So, uh, so our staff's incredible. I think from a coaching standpoint, training standpoint, and then and then as far as the summer league coming, that's they'll get back into it, and and we'll be in, uh, you know, 
in Vegas before you know it, and uh, and there'll be a number of players that we will see that will come through there. They'll uh, we'll have Kasib from Sioux Falls out there. You know, we'll have the trainers coming out and. And we try to marry that as much as we can. It hasn't been as easy the last couple of years because of uh, the pandemic and and everything sort of being sideways. So the G League has not taken a hit, but I think this year we're going to be investing a lot more time and attention into into that. But a lot of the players came came from there, not just on our team. Okay, everybody talks about the guys that were two way players that, that came here that uh, that have made it or are on their way to making it, and then. You go around the league and take a look at all the other teams. There's, you know, three or four players on every team, either young or players that are in the rotation that came from the G League and yeah, weren't drafted. Yeah. Second question. I just speak to some of the younger core kids and, and especially gave Vincent feeling like he said, I, I think I've earned my role to be a rotational player in this league. Mm -hmm. uh, just speak to the progress of some of these um, up and coming names and, you know, the, the progress of Max, Max Drew stepping into a, <coughs> um, a role three years into the league and, and just um, his confidence level and, and, you know, what they've given back to the, uh, the core squad. Right. It, it changes uh, with young players who, all of a sudden they they hit it. They think they hit it. And so the work ethic from, you know, Gabe, uh, Caleb, you know, Max, you know, all of our young guys, you know, that that basically have played and in, in, in sort of helped us. I'm not talking about Bam or Tyler or Duncan. They've been around for a while. They seem like veterans. But they still have to come to training camp. And if he feels that way and and – his time on the court, you know, whether it's rotational player, uh, spot player, or a starter, has to equate to winning. So it's always about winning. I mean, you can you can play young players till you're blue in the uh, face, but do you want to play them, you know, at the expense in in the medieval <laughs> late quarters of a playoff game, and they haven't been there before. So I think Gabe's one of those guys. I think he has that in him. He has he has something about him as a competitor and does Max that uh, that I think eventually they can get there. And so, you know, Max found out that, you know, I'm not a 40% shooter in against the Celtics, <laughs> you know, or against, you know, or against Philadelphia because they're not going to give you that look, but he has a very unique game and a very unique shot that, and I think Spo spoke to this, and we talk a lot of, uh, about the stress now that, that defenses are putting on three-point shooters and, and how they're running you down and staying with you on the line, making you go back door and, and making you work harder. So you have to develop yourself as, as, as a complete player. You got to be able to go downhill. Max has to be able to go downhill and finish. Now he can't be going downhill and putting up layups and missing. You know, and he's got to be able to go downhill and you know make a little pull-up jumper, and he's got to make layups. And so, his game you know has to change uh, a little bit, and and he knows this, and he'll develop this. But I think they have the ability to do this. And and uh, and watching Tyler in his rookie season. And then watch him in, in, in now. I mean, when he goes to the basket, you know, he's got these runners and he's got, you know, one handed shots off the board. So you have to create more offensive opportunities than just be a sticker. I, I know this was two and a half months ago, but we haven't talked to you since this. But what did you make of the sideline confrontation with, you know, uh, Spo, Jimmy, UD, and uh, does Jimmy's, I guess, competitiveness, his intensity remind you of anybody you've coached? <laughs> And me. <laughs> I like, I think my favorite comment from a player all year was, uh, I don't know, something happened. There was an altercation with Jimmy and some other player on another team. And he just threw up his arms and he said, oh, let's just go brawl. <laughs> you know, let's go to the back parking lot and brawl. But, uh, you know, getting back to that one incident, uh, it happened, and it was handled quickly, and and they got beyond it, and that's 
this, this league, there's a lot of passion in this league when it comes to winning. And I think a lot of the players today, they have a lot more input, a lot more input. And, and they're, he's smart as hell. He's got a tremendous basketball IQ about how the game should be played, uh, how you respond to people, how you talk to each other. I think there's a, there's a great respect on our team for each other, but we got some real, as Bam calls them, you know, dogs in that locker room. And, uh, you know, when things don't go well, they get the snapping at one another. And so, you know, it can't be a regular occurrence, but uh, that happened to happen in public. Uh, it's happened to me before, and, uh, you know. And I got into an argument one time on, on the bench with a player that he wanted me to go to the locker room. And I was trying to throw him to, out. He was, no, you go to the locker room. And then, no, I, you got to go to the locker room. And I said, no. I said, I get to throw you out of the game to the locker room. He said, no, I'm not going. I said, you know, so what am I going to do? I have to wait till, the, till after the game. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing that. I didn't like it. Uh, they didn't like it. Spo didn't like it. I don't think uh, anybody liked it. But you take a look at what's going on in the, in the championship series right now. I mean, these teams want to win so bad that, you know, I think the sparks have just begun to fly. But there will be a winner, and it won't be the one that yells the most or fights the most. It's going to be the best team. Yeah. Coach, good to see you, Pat. Eric, how you doing? Doing well. First, first, first thing, I'm glad to hear that you're a, a Walking Dead viewer. That, that's good to know. <laughs> uh, no, uh, no, it's Karen, my, 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 my administrative assistant. You know, 27 years, Karen has been here. And she would come in every day and tell me what happened the night, like the night before. And I said, Karen, uh, walking what? You know, walking <laughs> dead? So I watched a couple of them one night. But anyhow, now I know what you do on your off hours. You know, I, I credit my wife to that, too. Um, just cur for, talked about Summer League. That's where we first saw Omer Yurtsevin last year. And then that, that run he had during the middle of this year. I'm just curious to what you saw of him, uh, where you think he's at, and where you think he might be able to get to. Well, he did show, you know, a double-double game for, I think, 14 games or as many games as Bam missed. I mean, he's he, so he was prolific as a rebounder and, and also as a scorer and finished well. Uh, he definitely needs to improve in certain areas of strength, mobility, footwork, you know, back to the basket, strength, that kind of stuff. Also defensively, that, that will all come with him. Uh, I avoided the question with uh, Ira about whether or not Omer and, and Bam, you know, can play together. I, probably they could. And it depends on who the other three guys are around. And, and so, uh, you know, that, that's a decision that, you know, Eric, you know, will make, you know, based on, you know, you know what kind of a fit is it. It isn't something you just put together. But uh, you hate to experiment during the course of the season. Uh, in a way that it's going to cost you wins, you know. So, um, you know, Dwayne Dedman had a great year, you know, and and that was a, a good combination. Will Spo go a little bit bigger with the thought that, well, I need to have a stretch three, you know, and or a stretch, you know, five that can make threes and and bam, uh, that's something that I think he'll he'll work out. And but I think it's something that that. You make a good point about that. Sometimes we, we might have to play big, but you got to make sure that you get the right fit on the two bigs. One last thing, uh, your thoughts on Mike Fratello getting the Chuck Daly Award this weekend? Uh, I, I did get a, uh, I didn't see it, but I got from Ronnie Rothstein and Tony Ferentino sent me the article. And uh, I haven't gotten back to Mike yet, but uh, I will send him you know, one of his uh, one of my surly texts to Mike, and uh, he deserves it. You know, I, I can remember Mike and I back in the 80s. Uh, he was coaching Atlanta, and he had this curly hair. You know, you see him on the sidelines, you know. I asked him one time, I said, Mike, are you actually doing it, or, or is it just natural, you know? I mean, so, and then he saw me two weeks later, and I had curls in the back of my my hair, you know, and we go back a long way with stories like that. But he was he was one of the great uh, coaches, defensive coaches, uh, and clinicians, and teachers. And you know, I can remember sitting with him and, and Ronnie, you know, 
uh, in LA one time, just at a dinner, just talking basketball and hoops. And uh, it's as if those guys that you know were raised up in that area of New Jersey, it's like they have this this cult, and and they all understand you know basketball and 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 where everybody came from, and the players and coaches and. Uh, and Mike was part of all of that. And uh, I can remember talking to Mike about, uh, you know, what do you have in your, in your garage? Because all coaches just store all their notes and everything in their garage. And he would bring out books from Hubie and books from, uh, from other coaches and stuff. But he's, uh, he's very deserving of it. I'm happy for him. I really am. All right. Thank you. Thank okay, you, everybody. Thank you. Good summer. Mm-hmm.